Hello and welcome to this Research Into Action series. I'm Vanessa Kiesler. I'm an education research consultant working with the Grand Valley Charter Schools Office. And today's topic is best practices in school leadership with a focus on time management. So before we move into that, I wanted to remind you that the Grand Valley Charter School Office does their own research and makes it available to you. So you can see that QR code on the screen. Uh, if you go there, you can see past projects, current projects. And just a reminder, sometimes, often, the research being done by GVSU Charter School Office requires or includes surveys of you or your team. So if you are asked to participate in a survey, please make sure to do so. Uh, it's so important to have good coverage, uh, good representation across the whole network, uh, and that data really helps drive improvements in practice and helps us understand um, both about the Grand Valley network, but just about schools in general. So thanks for your active participation in research. Okay, we're gonna dive right in for some school leadership talking today. Uh, so what do we know about school leadership? There are five big things we know that I won't unpack in great detail today. We've done some other research into actions on this, but just to remind you, effective school leadership has a positive and lasting impact on organizational performance, meaning how the school itself does. Um, related to that, effective school leadership has a positive impact on learning and learner outcomes. That impact is primarily through teachers, teacher leaders, and other leaders. So a quote from this article is, effective school leaders focus on leadership for learning first and everything second. Just looking at those two bullet points, um, you being an effective school leader matters, and you being an effective instructional leader matters the most. So keep that in mind as we talk about time management. Uh, effective school leadership is distributed widely and wisely. So having a, a shared leadership, distributed leadership model. Effective school leaders build collaborative practices and foster inquiry. Um, you want to be a leader who is collaborating and encourages collaboration with your team, and you want your team to be able and willing to ask questions. And then effective school leaders are system leaders. So you're thinking about not just the day-to-day, -day, but the system level. Because the focus of this is on time management for school leaders, I am going to invoke Stephen Covey. Um, and this quadrant that he put out whenever he did it is really, I think, impactful for a lot of professionals, but I think it's like it's designed for school leaders, right? So all day long, you are faced with a number of tasks. You are faced with really urgent tasks, um, and you are faced with really important tasks. And making sure you're spending your time on the right level of urgency and importance is critical. So if it's urgent and important, uh, the way Stephen Covey says it is, you do that. And again, as a school leader, there's a lot going on and you need to react and be involved in the things that are urgent and important. For the things that are urgent but not important, you need to delegate, you need to use your team, you need to really think about what it is that you have to do that only you can do as a school leader. And that, is found in quadrant two, important but not urgent. In that quadrant are the things where it's not on fire, it's not gonna jump to the top of your list because it's so emergent, but if you don't do it, no one else is going to do it. No one else is going to be paying attention to the important long-term things that are not happening today. So that's your quadrant. When you think about time management, asking yourself how much, how are you protecting your time to do the not urgent but important things? And then if it's not urgent and not important, which we all hope for more of those things in our life, try to eliminate it. Uh, going through that time audit of like, is, are any of these things important or urgent? Like, do we have to do them at all? And we'll refer back to this quadrant throughout this presentation. But again, I'm actually gonna sl flip back here. Uh, being an effective school leader for your organization and being an effective school leader, effective instructional leader through teachers, teacher leaders, and other leaders may not be the urgent thing on a lot of days. There's always going to be a kid with a crisis. There's always going to be a bus that's missing. There's always going to be something going on that is very urgent. Those things are important. You are charged with the safety and security of your students as well. And if you don't find time by delegating some of those to other people, if you don't find time to think about your leadership, your instructional leadership, and your organizational leadership, and to make specific plans, then, then you are missing your biggest opportunity as a school leader. 
Okay, how the best school leaders create enduring change. For this one, we're using, this is this really interesting study out of uh, Harvard Business Review. It actually was done in England, so it doesn't, all of it doesn't exactly translate, but they followed like 150 school leaders for like 10 years. So I like that because it's a nice longitudinal look at school leaders and the practices they used. Um, and they did, you know, they did qualitative work. They were in watching them, doing observations, and also doing things like surveys and looking at data. So it's kind of a comprehensive look. And they have this school performance pyramid. There's nine things on the pyramid. We're not gonna talk about all of them today. Um, both for time sake and because I think a couple are a little less relevant. But there's nine things that um, school leaders do to create enduring change. Challenge the system, staying for at least five years. That one's self-explanatory. We know the turnover rate is high, but if you want to see the change that you want as a school leader, staying is important. Um, there's the curve too, right? Like you're making change, whatever, and you don't necessarily see some of the outcomes of your change if you don't stay for at least five years. Teaching everyone, limit expulsion, um, challenging the staff, engaging students. We're gonna dig into these more in the next slide, so I won't go into them right now. We're not going to talk a lot about challenging the board today, but they found that is part of being good school leaders is you know, when the board needs to be challenged to raise their expectations, you do it. Uh, engaging parents, engaging staff, teaching better, which again, it's a short bullet, but a big idea. And then teaching kids for longer is one we're not going to talk about much today either because this is more specific to England's model. So kind of taking challenging the staff and teaching better and putting them together. And again, going back to the research I cited at the front and the Stephen Covey quadrant, your number one job is to be an instructional leader and to be very focused on the instructional quality experienced by your students. And I'm just gonna say that one more time because as I keep talking to school leaders, as I keep le reading the research, it's so clear that this is the thing that makes change in schools when the leader is an instructional leader. And it's also so clear that it is a really hard thing for school leaders to find time, make time, protect their time to do. So just know if you are making choices that help you as a school leader be a better instructional leader and be focused on instructional quality, that is a good choice. It is supported by all the research and it is a practice of a highly effective school leader. Some specific strategies, all of which could use a lot of detail, but today we'll stay a little bit high level. Clarifying instructional targets. So talking to your staff about what you're trying to do instructionally. What are the practices? What are the targets? And then making sure that is constantly implemented, evaluated, discussed. Um, looking at real-time performance data for staff to review. Attendance, behavior, test scores, whatever you agree are the indicators of those practices, look at that data in real time and talk about it. Don't be afraid to take on poor performers. You know, if there are staff who are not engaging in good instructional practices, if there are staff who are not willing to be focused on instructional quality, even though it's hard and in an era of staffing shortages, it can feel detrimental. Just remember that every year that that teacher stays, that's 30 to maybe 120 more kids who have a net, whose trajectory of learning has been negatively impacted. Uh, recruiting talented teachers. Again, this can be challenging in a short staffing space, but it is a practice, you know, if you, it's a practice that is um, a good one for you as a school leader to put your time into. Increasing those informal teaching observations. This really goes with the instructional targets and goes with the bigger one. As an instructional leader, you can't really be a good instructional leader if you're not spending time in classrooms doing informal teaching observations. Um, and these are for feedback and for you to understand what's happening in the school. They're not for high stakes evaluation purposes, um, but they are critical, a critical use of your time. And then creating time for collaboration and sharing best practices. Uh, there's a lot of research around the importance of collaboration for teachers. There was a Grand Valley uh, charter school office survey that found that a really positive relationship between collaboration and teacher satisfaction. So making sure you're creating that time, not only for you to engage with them around instructional quality, but for the teachers to engage around instructional quality is critical. Uh, engaging students. So this is again coming from the research, coming from the performance pyramid in this article. The research shows that performance improve when at least 95% of students attend all of their classes, when kids get in school. Unfortunately, as we all know right now, that is that attendance target feels wild in today's context. 
Um, Michigan's chronic absenteeism rate, students missing 10 or more days a year, is over 35% right now. And if you know any students, so many of them are, they are not, they're not at school, they're, they're, they're disengaged. So this gets into why they aren't attending class. They're not just staying home to stay home. I mean, they are, but there's a very big lack of engagement. Kids just do not see the purpose. And if the instructional quality is not there, and if kids are getting worksheets or movies or just boring, repetitive content, they are not going to be motivated to come to class. They're going to say, Kids are rational actors. They're going to say, this is a waste of my time, and then they're not going to go. And they might be right that day, but then obviously over time, if they're not in class, they can't get good instructional quality, instructional quality so you get this like self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so anyway, a really important job for you as a school leader is to be thinking about that student engagement. Are your students engaged? Why not? And then coming back to that instructional quality. Is there a reason for them to come to school and learn beyond just you have to? And that's not just that's not enough of a motivation for uh, this generation of students. So some specific ideas, asking students to respond to engagement surveys. There are um, some engagement surveys that are available through the Michigan Department of Education. Uh, different, you know, there's different, you don't have to build your own. There's ones that are out there. Um, but have some data on student engagement. And then tell students what you found and what you're doing about it. So. If, you, if they just give you data and then they never hear back about any change that's been made, even if you made a change, they don't know. And so they don't think you're listening. Uh, something that the research suggested that I love, but I have not heard anybody do, although if anybody does it, please call me and tell me how it goes. Asking students to evaluate teachers. I just think that would be such an empowering practice for students, and if done well, could be a really, really valuable source of feedback for your teachers. And then creating mentorship programs between older and younger students. This again gives kids a reason to engage with school and to be there and helps them understand what it's like to try to be a role model, teach, you know, help support a younger student. Engaging parents. Uh, again, that Harvard Business Review study found that at the, uh, the goal of those high quality school leaders or the number that seemed to be the right goal was having at least 50% of parents and families at parents' evenings or other parent events. We just did a, another research into action recently talking about family engagement and some strategies there. So I think know that family engagement is a really important factor in student academic outcomes, particularly if, you're, particularly if you are serving uh, historically underserved communities. And so again, thinking back to, I'm a school leader, where do I put my time? Creating engagement and empowerment opportunities for parents is a positive and effective use of your time. And then engaging with your staff, um, trying to make sure reduce staff absences. Research shows having 70% with no absences is the good target to be working toward. Um, engaging staff in informal observations of other teachers. If again, if done well, this would be so extraordinarily powerful. You know, when I was a teacher, having another teacher observe me and give me positive, not just positive, but constructive feedback was critical. Uh, it would also help teachers improve their own practice. So going back to your instructional leader, figuring out how to set this up would have multiple benefits for you. Uh, potentially visiting other schools to see best practices, and then simplifying processes to reduce administration or paperwork. Um, this would help you, going back to the quadrant, if you could lower everybody's um, important but not urgent or urgent and important. Like a lot of times paperwork falls in like urgent and kind of important. If there's anything to do to make that less and take less of people's time so they have it to be focused on quality, you would all benefit from that. Um, in the Grand Valley Charter School survey that I mentioned already, uh, the teachers talked about that they wanted meaningful dialogue with their school leaders, that they wanted to be, again, part of shared decision making, and they wanted to be able to collaborate with their school leaders. So these are all practices for you as a school leader to engage your staff. Research into action, we always end with some practical suggestions. Uh, don't try to do it all. Even though I just gave you a laundry list, if you go back through, you think about your time pie, that's sometimes a mental image I think of. So I've got you know, so many hours in the day. How do I carve out some of that pie for the important, not urgent work? You know, where do I, what's the urgent and important I have to do? What are some of the other pieces? And even from the Harvard Business Review study, they said there's nine blocks to this pyramid, but 
the best school leaders did at least six of the nine. And so it's, it's not even, even though those nine are all good, they're not even saying you have to do all nine. Um, so figure out where you're gonna focus, stick with it and track your progress. Again, focusing on teachers and focusing on your relationships with them, um, prioritizing your relationships with teachers and staff and engage in, if you are not comfortable giving feedback to staff, both on their instructional quality or any other kind of feedback, then do your own professional development work to get comfortable. It's, I cannot say it enough in this, your number one job as a school leader is to be that instructional leader, which means you have to have a good close working relationship with your staff where you can be giving them feedback in an, a regular ongoing manner. Again, increasing those informal observations and feedback to teachers. And then on this, again, it's two way, you're giving them feedback, but ask your staff for feedback and then listen to it. <laughs> and I put that in all caps because very often, I think leaders, we ask for feedback and then it can be overwhelming or it's too much or you know our time pie is overflowing. And so then we don't take their feedback and internalize it, we just kind of collect it. And that leaves people feel disengaged, dis disempowered. So something I've done as a leader and many different times is um, send an email to all your staff and ask them to privately respond to you and give you one thing you're doing well, because as a leader, we need to fill up our own cup of affirmation so that we don't um, get too burned out and give up. Um, and then one thing you can improve. Then put that all together and share a summary with the team and then say, okay, I'm gonna work on these one or two, maybe three at the most things. Here are my action steps to respond to the feedback you've given me. And this helps create a better trusting relationship for you to give them feedback on their performance and it helps you improve the organizational quality of your school. In terms of understanding engagement, school climate data, where, you know, how students and staff feel, you do have the Grand Valley Charter School School Operations Survey. It was administered uh, last year. I think it's gonna be administered again this year. It's on that QR code that I showed you. So take advantage of that. Look at that evidence because it's about your schools and say, here's, here's how, um, here's where engagement levels are. Here's how teachers feel. Like use that as you can take on board as a leader. And then again, I just mentioned asking staff for feedback with informal methods, like a short survey or just an email and then I think school climate stuff sometimes goes into like, oh, unless we perfectly define it and then we have to do this massive data collection and then people get burned out and they give up. Just don't, to use a cliche, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. It's okay to pick a couple things you're gonna work on in terms of school climate, a couple pieces of data that you think relate to it and not overthink this one. This is going to sound like a little bit of a sidebar, but I always bring this back up when I'm thinking about what the research says where school leaders could spend their time. There is this weirdly huge body of research about the impact of disruptions on student learning. The, you know, the PA system going off, the kids coming in late, taking attendance, announcements, whatever. I mean, it's, it's like kids are losing 20, 30, 40 days of learning based on disruptions from different studies. So as a school leader, you could probably reduce those disruptions, make small changes to logistics that, mini that maximize class instructional time, and that could have a big impact. So a suggestion, just ask your teachers, what are the things that interrupt you when you're teaching and do you have any ideas for how to fix them? And then implement one or two things to do that. This would help with reducing those annoying paperwork, administrative burden feeling on teachers. It would reduce some of your time and would give you instructional time back as a, as a leader, give your teachers instructional time back. And again, this is in, shows up in the overall research base and it shows up in the Grand Valley um, School Operations Survey. So I keep bringing this up when I do these because I think this is a really powerful avenue for school leaders to make change that isn't necessarily what we think about when we think about instructional leadership, but that's you as a systems leader. That's you making the system better. Teachers wanna collaborate more, they need to collaborate more if you're focused on instructional time. So for you as the school leader and the, the system leader, you have to look at your school structure. How are you setting up your days? How are you setting up your teaching opportunities? How are you being innovative with your time? So again, just a couple do's and don'ts. Do have an attitude of yes. We often think I can't do that because people accounting or I can't do that because teacher cert rules or I can't, a lot of I can't and I'm not, the law is Byzantine and hard to implement. That, just give you that. But if you call the Grand Valley Charter School Office for Thought Partnership and your pupil accounting manager, 
there is a lot more flexibility in what you can do than you might think. MDE Office of Educator Excellence also gives you some creative staffing solutions. So if you're like, I don't know, I wanna do a co-teaching class in a two hour block with a project-based learning seat time waiver, like that's all stuff that exists. You do have to do some legwork as the school leader to figure it out. But don't be afraid to call your pupil accounting manager, call MDE, um, call Grand Valley Charter School Office and get, get somebody to help you craft the right setup to support your larger instructional goals. Parent engagement, we've already talked about participate in the professional education opportunities that Grand Valley offers. Uh, ask parents and guardians, like what, you know, how do you wanna be engaged? How can we work together? Another idea is hosting office hours for parents and guardians, and then um, providing, creating this forum for teachers and families to engage in dialogue on quality education. So creating this two-way communication and shifting from just engagement to empowerment. And that, those recommendations, again, come out of the Grand Valley uh, School Operations Survey, Grand Valley Charter School Office School Operations Survey from 2023. And good luck uh, with your school leadership, and thank you for your time today. Mm -hmm.